when you're sitting in, because here's the funny thing. I told you I had a kind of a wild life. I had had felonies in my younger days, never graffiti related. It was about getting some money. Mm -hmm. So as a grown man with a daughter with responsibility to be going through the system for graffiti, thinking like, really? When I reached a certain age, I put childish things away. And I still love some of those things, Mm. but they're not for me anymore. Mm. They don't love me. So if I try to go backwards and return to those things, there's always a price to pay. Mm. You understand? Knowing what I know now, you can't go back. You need the Kellervision app. 24-7 mini documentaries, podcasts, live shows, DJ live streams, top five, subscription packages, plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports. Download it from the App Store for free today. Instagram UK Frontline. Yo, Nolan Poland Records for underground classics. NoPolandRecords.com Box created. Killer Keller. And we're here to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Keller Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller Podcast, live and direct, central London, or as central as you need to be, choose to be, want to be, trust me, you don't want to be anywhere else, you can't afford it. It costs too much money. <laughs> <laughs> Transmitting to lie to you and yours, big shout out to graffitikings.co.uk, big shout out to Strain Station, big shout out to... Uh, no pollen records.com as well. We are transmitting for everyone out there that's sharing and caring. Keep it going. We're doing it for our health. We're doing it for you. We're doing it for the culture. Anyone's got the Television app free download, iPhone, Android for your street culture sports. We've got live streams. We've got DJ mixes, the work for your health. Well, as we know on this show, we deal with strictly the people that have the lineage. And the calibre and quality of artistical integrity to make it across all the different disciplines in hip-hop and street culture. And this gentleman, bar none, has been doing his thing for a hotter than hot minute. We're taking it right back to the early 80s and beyond with a gentleman that most definitely represented rap at an early stage, a b-boying, and also most definitely a graffiti. X-Men's Keo inside the place. How are you? Peace, peace. How was that? Killer Kel, my <laughs> man. Good that teaches stuff. you a lesson. <laughs> yes, sir. Peace to London. How are you feeling today? How's it going? I'm great, man. Um, I'm super grateful. My life is beautiful, man. Uh, I took my grandson to the aquarium. <laughs> Saw the sharks, saw the jellyfish, so life is good. And for somebody that's from the UK and doesn't often get a chance to go and see these places, like for those of you who don't know about the Sea Life Centre in, in uh, London, it's highly recommended by the, the, the main tourist at the moment, bro. Like, it, it must be crazy being back in London. It's like the second time you've been here. Yeah, this is only my second time, and um, the first time was a few months ago and there was a transit strike on. <laughs> so this time... I mean, the day I landed, the transit strike began. So I had a hard time getting around London, but I still managed, you know, no problem. The black cabs are the best. The guys got the knowledge, you know. They love to talk as well. They have a good chat. Yeah, yeah, everybody. (laughs) And then this time, the queen passed away. Mm. So I've never experienced London just moving free and clear. It's always something. Mm. And maybe maybe I'm the... Albatross. Maybe I bring the disaster with me. I don't bring know. the heat. Bring the drama. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm here. Next time I come, you guys are really gonna have to do something spectacular—a volcano or a, a tsunami or <laughs> yeah, something. Totally some, some other shit. <laughs> yeah, I've seen it all. Well, it's pleasures because the first time we we connected was at the exhibition that you had um, during the summer. Explain yeah. a bit about that because you yeah. know you're the, the pieces that were in the folder, the legacy pieces that were on sale at the time and on exhibition was sick. Well, here's the thing I've been um blessed to travel and to see the world, and I'm not a man of great means, I don't have a lot of money. I what I do have is strictly from the sale of my artwork. I don't have a plan B. I don't have a day job. I didn't graduate high school. I'm a, I'm a convicted felon. I'm not fit for much else. 
thank God I can sell artwork. So wherever I travel, I try to bring some things with me and I try to coordinate with the local shops, businesses, whatever it is. Hey, man, if you're interested in doing a pop up, I'll come through town, we'll promote it, you know, we can break bread. Uh, so whatever I sell, I'll give you a portion. And this has worked for me all over the world. I do them in Brooklyn as well, even in my hometown, because I do so many works on paper. I do so much, uh, like black booking is my therapy, so that I wind up with piles and piles of these drawings that eventually I have to unload some. You Yo, know? that's so sick. I hear stories of like writers in New York regularly writing in their black books to the point of selling, like almost like a, a, a hard copy NFT of just like yeah. nothing but... When I, once it's full... You almost have to get rid of some to free your mind wow. to be inspired to do some more. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I run out of room in my house. I have a small apartment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I, I have to. And, and then I'm able to sell my artwork. Sometimes, you know, it pays for the trip. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's a blessing, man, because I don't know too many people who make a living doing what they love. But doing it to the wire, like you say, like... You go to a country to sell something on an exhibition tip, knowing full well that you're at deficit in your bank, right? So then you have to sell, and then all of a sudden you sell something, and you're like, well, that's me so much for the month. Thank God for that, because I was had nothing. Listen, I got faith, man. I don't even sweat it. Like, the universe takes care of me, because a lot of my life... I was um, homeless, I was in the streets, I've been, I've been incarcerated, I've been institutionalized, and I was okay. I wasn't good, but I was okay, if mm -hmm. you understand what mm -hmm. I'm saying. So that now I'm living well, I'm healthy, um, I don't worry about a thing, bro. Mm. Like, you know, the universe is taking care of me, man. Is that wisdom coming with age? Is that a th would you say that that was part of the course that you take. Or maybe it's foolishness that comes with youth. <laughs> like uh, some people would tell me you're fucking crazy, mm -hmm. you need a job, you need health insurance, mm -hmm. you need a 401k, right? So uh, one man's wisdom is another man's foolishness. Mm -hmm. I say, um, you know, I didn't choose this path necessarily. It's just the one I'm on and mm -hmm. that it's working for me. I have to be grateful. It's a blessing. Yeah, it stabilizes off. You just go with the flow. Yeah. yeah so true. I, <laughs> like, something you got to understand about me, I never um, applied myself to anything else. I'm talking about from grade school, right? Mm. From eight, nine, ten years old, when I should have been studying, when I should have been doing homework, I'm doing graffiti. Yeah. So... They say you have to put 10,000 hours in to be a master of something. Mm. I probably got 10,000 hours in before I'm 12 years old. Yeah. So that now I'm 55 and I'm still on this practice. Um, if it ain't worth nothing, then I've wasted my entire life, you know? <laughs> Yo, it's a good point. So there must be some value in it, you know what I mean? And... Mm. Um, Perhaps one day, you know, after I'm dead, people will uh, see more value in it. Maybe, maybe it'll be worth something. Maybe it won't. I don't know. Dude, you said something interesting in the conversation that was had. I know maybe I'm slightly skew off in the way that I think uh, how I heard it because I was in part of the crowd and I came in halfway through, because there was a seminal moment when you were talking to the people that come down, big up Met, big up Drax, big up Funk, big, honestly, big up Merck, all the crew that were there. Yes, yes. It was such a good, such a good session, that, 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 that last exhibition. Um, and uh, you, you, you said something along the lines of what we've created here over a period of time is encapsulated and in decades and decades and decades from now, people will, artists, critics, will look back at this time in street art and um, query the reasons why such radical artists were being treated the way they were of their time. Ah, yeah, I remember what I was saying. So essentially what I know, and I told you I didn't finish school, so I'm, I'm not coming from an academic uh, standpoint, but what I do know of the study 
of ancient civilizations, right? Archaeologists, sociologists, so forth. They generally determine when they dig through the ruins, right? They find the layers. Mm. If there were artworks left behind, mm. pottery left behind, they that that's how they determine. Okay, this was a civilized people. Mm-hmm. They were not only just uh, hunting and gathering. They were writing poetry. They were painting. Yeah. They were creating. Right? I love that. They're shit. dealing with math and sciences. That's right. So I wondered when, if there's a human race, a hundred years from now. A thousand years from now, when they look back on this time and see that we put all our resources into eradicating Mm. the artwork that our youth were creating, locking them up, right? Um, We spent huge budgets Mm -hmm. destroying artworks that were freely given to society. It's going to be looked at as the most Philistine yes. civilization there ever was. Like these were these were um, warlike Cretans, mm. fucking brain dead motherfucker. You know. Um, so yeah, this is what I wondered because so much of what I did, I never photographed. Mm. It doesn't exist. Mm. It was buffed. Now. I have a few people, and and big up, I love you people that have sent me photos of my works that I haven't seen since I painted them. But generally, they're bad, Mm low-res, blurry photos, and it's already been buffed. It's been through the buff once or twice, (laughs) right? (laughs) Yeah, you're not the first person to say it. Like, a lot of people, they, even in the UK, a lot of people just didn't, they didn't think because they didn't have the cameras for starters. This wasn't a case of, oh, I didn't bother bringing my camera out today. It's like there was no camera. I didn't have a camera. (laughs) Listen, back then, um, the process of developing film was an expensive, time-consuming one. You had to send it away and wait for it to come back. And, you know, um, where I used to bench as a kid in Brooklyn... And mind you, I was not a tough kid. I was a tiny little white kid with glasses Mm. in a neighborhood that was um, known. It was known throughout the boroughs for stick-up kids, for strong-arm robbery. Like, you hear KRS say, Manhattan keeps on making it, the Bronx keeps creating it, Brooklyn keeps on taking it. KRS didn't invent that. That was a, a standardized rhyme that described each borough. See, Manhattan was known for players, hustlers, pimps, mm. cats who got money and dressed or a certain way. side of celebration. Or- yeah, but they might have mm. a Cadillac or whatever. The Bronx was known for being the hotbed of hip-hop, creativity. Oh, they're inventing new styles, right? Brooklyn was known for mugging, and we took pride in it. Mm. That's It's like you see this movie about Boston now, um... The town that had yeah, one small section yeah. that was famous for bank robberies and armored car robberies. And it was passed down from generation to generation. That's what they did. Wow. So my neighborhood was known for stick-up kids. Yoke artists, strong arm robbers, pickpockets. And for me to sit at the bench at Atlantic Avenue... All day, every day, watching the trains go by. Most every day, somebody tried me. And I didn't have, I was a poor kid. I didn't have Mm -hmm. um, gold chains and fancy stuff. They wanted to take the sneakers off Mm -hmm. my feet. I had to fight or run most every day. So to be out there with a camera... So that would have been bonkers. It would have gotten taken from me. <laughs> to be honest, I couldn't have kept the camera. Yeah. <laughs> you understand? Yeah. yeah, I do. I do. You could barely keep sneakers on your feet. Yeah. Oh. It was a different time. Man. Yeah, different time, man. Um, wh- while we're on that time, um, so we're talking what? Uh, uh, late seventies, early eighties. Yeah. Right. End of the seventies is when I really, really decided I was going to devote myself to this stuff. And it's around the same time, coincidentally, I decided I wasn't going to go to school. 
I was going to skip and play hooky as often as mm -hmm. possible. So for me, and this isn't um, true of everyone, I know people who uh, manage to be very successful at graffiti and still maintain some sort of a, a school or work mm. or, or a, a discipline. At the same time as um, graffiti came into play, I was rhyming, I was trying to dance, I was trying to do all these things. I was also into getting high, mm -hmm. very much so. And I had decided whatever I was going to do, it wasn't going to be through the conventional means. Yeah. You understand? I wasn't yeah. going to get it in school. Now, good, bad, and ugly. I got some, some valuable skills out of that. I also, you know, made some horrible choices. Mm. So... You know, it's a mixed bag. Yeah, the street can only take you so far. The acumen of, like, of schooling and stuff can only take you so far as well. 100%. It's a fine line, isn't it? And it's how you do anything. Yeah. So some people go to school and don't get anything out of it. <laughs> some people understand how to navigate that. Some yeah. people have a job and, 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 and understand how to work their way through the ranks. Mm. Other people uh, wind up miserable and, and, and broke. So it's the same with the streets. There were people who were able to dabble in the streets and not get caught up mm. in the negativity. I wasn't one of them. I jumped in with both feet, you know. I didn't, um, I didn't have any home structure, and I didn't have much guidance. Mm. So some people I knew, they had older brothers that had experience in the streets or someone to um, mentor them. Other people had strong parents that would only allow them, yo, you better be home by this time. Yeah. So they could only push the limit so far. Mm -hmm. I didn't have that. I used to stay out sometimes three days in a row at, at 11 and 12 years old and come home and nobody would say anything. Nobody would even ask where I'd been. Really? Yeah. <laughs> well, well, why is that? Well, it just the family structure just wasn't, it wasn't there uh, for, for, for support. Okay, how am I going to say this without, I don't, I, I love my father. He's a superhero to me now. At the time, I didn't always appreciate it. But they were hippies. They got high. They, you know what I mean? <laughs> like the first weed I ever smoked, I stole from my father. Right, okay. So mm. my mother um, <clears throat> caught brain cancer, a brain tumor, when I was maybe eight years old she was diagnosed with that wow. seven or eight so it was four more years of chemotherapy radiology surgeries hospitalizations when my father was struggling mm. just to keep a, a a roof over our heads he yeah, was yeah. out at work all the time my mother was sick so i didn't have any real supervision you have to understand my father he was a painter he was an artist and he did carpentry mm. in people's homes, not like with a with a construction company mm. or some sort of an outfit for himself. He was a cabinet wow. maker. Yeah. So he had no insurance, no real, you know, he would paint for six months out of the year to try to have a show. And then he would do carpentry for six months to make enough mm -hmm. money to paint again. So when my mom got ill, I don't think we had any real... Uh, family monies or insurance to mm. fall back on. So I couldn't see it when I was a kid. All I could see is, well, why isn't my father here for me when mm. I need him, right? Mm. And you become rebellious and you become resentful. The truth was he was out there busting his ass to keep food in the fridge. And mm. a lot of um, men would have dropped us off at grandma's house yeah, and yeah. disappeared. So in retrospect, I say he was a superhero, but at the time, I had a chip on my shoulder, and I learned oh. that I could get away <laughs> with just about anything. Do you think that a lot of what you went on to do, particularly from the rebellious side of like graffiti, was that an escapism for you? Was that something that would detracted from maybe some painful Yeah, 100%. And, yeah. It's no mystery now, mm. in hindsight. You okay. couldn't have told me that at the time. I'd have said... The, Are you, you know, crazy or no? Not yeah. at all. <laughs> no, I'd have said, suck my dick. Yeah. <laughs> that was my standard answer to anything. But, yeah, I was more frightened 
of staying at home and dealing with what my mom was going through and grieving mm-hmm. and, and looking my my family in the eye as my family was falling apart than I was of anything in the street. Mm-hmm. So I, I saw the street, even though it was crazy place and violent and dangerous, it seemed to me easier than um, dealing with, with my family dynamic. So I, I, I was not afraid of anything in the street. Mm-hmm. I was scared to death of... Um, you know, feeling my feelings mm. of having to grow the fuck up. You mm. know what I mean? So in the street, I could stay high. And back then, it was so easy, man. We stole the 40 ounces that we drank. We stole wine. We stole liquor. Weed it was harder to steal, but $3 used <laughs> to buy a bag. So if you had 35 cents, 50 cents, we yeah, could all chip easy. in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Um, we began to hang out on Myrtle Avenue, where the weed spot was. So when the kids from Brooklyn Heights, meaning little rich kids, Mm -hmm. would skip across to buy weed, they had to cut back through this park to get back to Brooklyn Heights. Oh, there you go. (laughs) And we just tax them. Yo, run it. Empty your pockets. And we sat there and we stayed high all day, every day. And that was basically um, my existence we stole everything food to eat Mm. clothes to wear you know what i mean i people talk about racking in terms of spray paint and art supplies survival bro but i was racking clothes so that i could fit in Mm. before i ever um stole spray paint i wanted to have the right gear because i thought my survival in the street depended on me yeah, looking a certain way and fitting in. So let's get into this then, because th- there's a, a lot of unquestioned, you know, a lot of questions that we need to ask here. One of the one of the key questions for me is like you you, you getting into graph, you're you got Brooklyn style, like you got a you got a real flair, and arguably that there's there's elements of it which are identifiable, particularly in the MF Doom work you've done. And Thank you. And various, various other, you know, projects that you've done. Like, so where did that come from? Older cats that I looked up to, um, cats who mentored me and taught me. As I, as I mentioned to you earlier, um, before we began recording, I'm not, people call me old school or whatever, but in graffiti, there were three generations before me already mm-hmm. established. The, the game plan was laid out. Mm-hmm. So I'm born in 1967. Most accounts I can trace back, say the movements. I talked to LSD Ohm, mm-hmm. big up Chad. He told me he started writing that, Chad. in 1967. He was writing Chad with a peace sign after it. So a lot of folks that I spoke to say 1967, the year I was born, is when the New York City graffiti style began to develop because spray paint became commercially available on the market. You're born into the game, bro. That's mad. So they were already, and you know, a generation in graffiti might be three, four years. Yeah, yeah. Dudes are bombed for three, four years. By the time you're 16 or 18, you're ready to retire. T- t- didn't Scheme, like Scheme was over, obviously in the Star Wars, but he only did two, two years. years. Yeah, that's right. 1982, he, he joined the military. Yeah, that was it. And but people have this kind of, and rightly so, uh, revered highly. He did his thing. But, he but did in his two thing. years, he yeah. established himself. But also, and no disrespect to Scheme, you tell your own story. What I saw and what the photos tell is that he aligned himself with the right masters. Mm. He painted with Phase 2, with Teen and Cade, with Mm. dudes that came from the generation before him. Mm -hmm. And if I'm misspeaking, forgive me, this is just what I observed. Because that was my own experience, that I got good based on the teachers I had. Yo, it's so important, bro. Yeah, and that (laughs) I was able to pass that on yeah. and teach someone else. And if you don't have something that you can pass on, yeah. if you can't give it to the next generation, then you never had shit. And you've got to listen to the dons. If you, if you ain't reaching and aspiring to work with the dons and you ain't listening to the dons, then you ain't, you ain't really, you, you've got no weight to yeah. what, what you're creating. Well, there are some guys who have a different philosophy 
well, you know, the bombers oh, that okay, don't care sure. about style. Mm-hmm. And all you need is some supplies and a set of balls, and mm-hmm. you can go all out. Yeah, true. Me, I was never interested in um, being the most up or the most famous. I tried doing throw-ups and insides, and it kind of bored me. Mm. When I saw my own shit go by, I was like, whatever. I wanted to burn. I wanted to have style. And that required a whole lot of study and Mm. a whole lot of practice and somebody to mentor you Mm. because you can show me any writer that's got real style today out of the States, and I can probably tell you what their family tree is. Mm. The fault lines who, of what yeah, that yeah. is. Who, who their great-grandfather is in Yo, this game. So who, is your, who are your mentors? I've, I've been blessed to have many in this game. So the first cats, my, I have an older brother that went to school with a guy named Strike RTW. So I used to hang around him, and my brother would be like, get out of here. Mm-hmm. But I had more in common. As graffiti became a thing, and I'm talking now about 1976, the bicentennial, my brother was in IS-293, junior high school. That's middle school, what do you, what yeah, do yeah. you guys call it? Yeah, yeah, college. Kind intermediate. Of yeah, yeah, intermediate, that's the one. So my brother is like 13. I'm a four years younger than him. So he's 12, 13 at the time. Mm -hmm. I'm four years younger than him hanging around his friends talking about graffiti, which he can't relate to because he didn't Mm -hmm. write. So his friends who wrote, you know, if they came to the house or they were around, I was picking their brains. Mm -hmm. So that was the first guy I really, because I knew other writers in the neighborhood and I looked up to them. We had great writers from my neighborhood all through, you know, the early, early 70s that I saw. Some lived on my block. There was a guy named CP3 who was down with FMD, NCBs, TD, the Destroyers, the No Comp Mm -hmm. Boys. He passed away. Rest in peace. Rest in peace. But these guys I looked up to, but they weren't messing with me as Mm. much as I would try to, you know, bother mm. them or whether they were like get out of here mm-hmm. you know this ain't for you kid go mm. home so the first cat I really um got to go riding with cause I had my little friends my age and we already considered ourselves graffiti writers but we were toys right and we didn't know how to find the trains mm-hmm. where they were laid up how to do you know we were basically um, figuring it out, the blind leading the blind. We've all been there. <laughs> yeah. So the first cat that really, really um, showed me the ropes, he wrote Sake. Mm. And he was from Flatbush. And uh, he and his partner, Set Three, they were pretty much kinging the... F line, the E's and the F's in 1979. Hmm. They were racing with another crew from Queens called TPA. So they were TPC, and it was just two of them. Wow. And TPA was a larger crew from Queens. So if you understand how the F line works, the yard is in Jamaica, Queens at the end of the line. Right. In Brooklyn, we just had little layups where you could catch one or two sets. They had the whole yard. Right. So the advantage was quite (laughs) precedented. Right. But when it would get cold, because these F trains were these brand new computerized ding dong trains, they called them. They had some type of a uh, new technology, but when it got below 30 degrees, it would stop working. Really? So they couldn't park them outdoors <laughs> in the yard. They would put them all in the tunnels. Oh, so it became fatal. As soon as it got cold, a snowstorm, we'd get the call. Yo, yeah. let's go. Let's go, yo. That's right. sick. So they had to keep them all underground. And that's basically um, where my train writing experience came first before that it was motion tags Mm. you know little kids riding the train and we used to have markers like like 
like this. But as you're watching and little, listening and watching. Little tiny things, yeah, you know. old school. Yeah. We didn't understand about a mop or a mini or a unit. I love that you've got a pen in your pocket, just in case of trouble. <laughs> you know what I mean? I might need it. He might need it. He might need it. <laughs> Listen, man, um, you know, never leave home without it. That's it. That's the old quote of the TV. Um, how interesting that that was your first experience of painting trains, just on severe circumstances based on the technology faults of the train. And it was weather, you know, Incredible. there's so many factors, right? So many variables, man. Yeah. So a lot of the guys that you see in um, subway art and the films and the historical things, they made their bones during the transit strike of 1980. Really? Because it was a, like a free-for-all. That yeah. was an opportunity. So dudes who were a little older than myself and already a little more experienced, yeah. when they heard transit strike, okay, get the paint, you know what I mean? Like, Ease up, let's go. Right. <laughs> These guys were able to do 15, 20 cars in that transit strike, yeah. which is a body of work that now, you yeah. know, yeah. That's then revered and, um, re well, t attempts are replicated to a great success, but, but they had the luxury of having the strike. Yeah, and you know. But would you say that was also the case with lockdown and COVID? There was a, an upper hand there that, that allowed for a little bit more, you know, I saw the chaos. streets, the streets of New York City got crushed hmm. during COVID. Um, that winter, there was nobody on the street. It was empty. There was little um, law enforcement out. Hmm. I didn't see a lot of trains get done. I'm sure they got done, but they don't run. Mm. So what what it would take to get New York system to run these days? We we talked about this and played you know fantasy mm. football yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, rather than and this is a tip for you Europeans who like to travel, uh, Australians. I mm. see you guys coming to New York doing your thing. Yeah. Rather than painting whole car burners. The way to really change the game would be to do one little throw up on every car. Because then one's guaranteed they gotta run to it. move. See, right now they have so many trains that if you smash a whole train, they just take it out of service. Mm. Depending on where you hit it, it's going to run to Coney Island, to Buff, out of service, no passengers, but you might get a flick of it mm -hmm. in motion. Or it's going to run to 207th, what they call the ghost yard. Yes, it, the to ghost Buff, Right, right. But if you smack every, like bring a coordinated um, crew <laughs> and hit every car they got with a little something, a nice little throw up, they would have to run them. Mm -hmm. They'd have no choice. And um, the resources, I feel as though, you know, when I was, I was recently in uh, Italy, in, in uh, Napoli. Beautiful. Beautiful town. Beautiful. Lovely. Good people. Bellissimo. But they're um, bankrupt economically. Mm. They don't have the money to buff the trains. They mm -hmm. don't have the money for law enforcement. They're busy fighting real crime. It reminded me of New York City oh, yeah. in the late 70s. Oh, that's crazy. Because um, graffiti was mm -hmm. a low priority. Yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? Like... They had bigger fish to fry. For real. And less um, grease to fry it. So <laughs> I feel like that time is coming around again. Mm. Definitely Europe is feeling it with the crash of the euro. Yeah. yeah. And mm. the infrastructure begins to suffer, but creativity goes up. Yeah. Because when kids have everything and access to everything, um, it's too easy. Yeah. They don't have to work for it, you know. And at this point, we don't advocate any of this on the show. This is a nice little story, you understand, okay? Don't try <laughs> Fantasy this football. Fantasy football. All <laughs> this is fantasy, okay? Just made up stories for your entertainment pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> if you get bagged, don't say Keo told me yeah. to do it. I, I don't advocate this. Yo. Um, yeah, what a story. I would like to just join in dots right here. Bringing up the subject of X Men, Scotch seventy nine, and talk a little bit more about the crew itself, um, and yeah, just this this period in your career. 
So the first real crew I got down with, and when I say real, I mean one that was already established. Mm -hmm. I didn't make it up myself with my <laughs> boys. I right? come up with some letters because we had some funny ones. Um, was called TPC, which was the people's choice, the party crashers, the proud crowd, which the proud crowd now sounds a little LGBT, CBGBs. Mm -hmm. but, so it should um, do well. <laughs> back then it meant something else. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Then the next real crew that I got down with would be X-Men. And they started in my neighborhood. Like I grew up on Dean and Nevins, and then later I moved to State and Nevins. Mm. But Nevins Street is like a corridor from Wyckoff Projects to the top of Fulton Street where it dead ends, where Albee Square Mall is. Mm. Just Nevins Street was all X-Men. And most Damn. most of them went to a school called Brooklyn Tech. I didn't go to Brooklyn Tech, but I lived in the neighborhood. So um, actually, So and Tattoo started the crew at high school in Brooklyn Tech. I got down afterwards. So I'm not even the original, original members. Wow. I was like the second string to that be chosen. so to the wire of where it began. That just blew my mind, dude. That is fucking incredible. But X-Men was an interesting crew because we weren't known as style writers per se, even though we had some dudes who could burn. We were more known for numbers. Yeah, 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 yeah. We were um, all city. We threw parties. We had DJs. We had, it was more like how you think about Zulu Nation, mm -hmm. like encompassing all the mm -hmm. um, elements, having chapters, having girls down mm -hmm. with us. <laughs> we opened clubs. We sold our own brand of dust for a while. Really? Yeah. We had a stamp on it called Double Vision. You no. Know I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so we, we were branching out. It wasn't strictly a uh, graffiti crew. As my man So would say, it was a social organization that's sick there's a there's a uh, couple of crews like that that, that that are reminiscent of that atg over here being one of them for sure um at this point big up uh, drax who was the all touring wd yeah um, world domination yeah team rambo all that yeah, good rest stuff peace robo man gooners uh, yes yeah. sir <laughs> <laughs> that's oh, yeah. family that's byi yeah so for real that's for real. my brooklyn people mm. you understand and that it's now extended over here. Like I said, this is only my second time in London, but I'm already oh, man. welcome. Come on, you are welcome. I got family. family. You, you have understand? family here. And that's been my experience all over the mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes in New York, it's nothing but hate. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a prophet is without um, honor in his own hometown. Yeah, isn't it? Heavy is the crown that holds. Yeah. The yeah right, so, you know, like when you, you go other places, you get the love. Mm. That's why I like to travel. And it's why I try to go out of my way if somebody comes to New York to show them the same kind of respect. The hospitality. Man. Either. Yeah, man. Yeah. Because we used to give guys a real hard time. Mm. If you were from somewhere else, you were unofficial. Mm. And you were probably going to get robbed and beaten yeah. and shaken down. If, if, if nothing else, you were going to get a bum steer. You mm -hmm. would have asked for directions and we would have sent you the wrong way. Yeah, yeah, you understand? Yeah, yeah. So now, um, really big up to Wayne. Wayne COD big was the Wayne. first guy I seen welcoming, not only welcoming, hosting yeah. cats from all over the world. He's the real deal. And bringing them to paint and showing. And Lovely. He opened up, you know, a, like an ambassadorship mm. where now he can go anywhere on this planet yeah. and, and dudes show him love. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? He's got his own for graph, you know. Yeah, man. But you're a man of honor too, bro. Like, you, you know, when we met out the first time, you're like, yeah, I'm going to come back over and we'll do it. And true to your word, you're here, man. Yeah. I, try to, I try to keep up my word. But like I say, I've been um, most of my life running wild mm. so I wasn't really a man of responsibility or a man that you could nail down so mm. now today I try and live a little differently if I mm. say we're gonna wake up early tomorrow and go to the gym and work out or whatever it is I need to be there yeah, yeah, yeah. whether I want to or not it's, the place it's in important your head, right? to me yeah yeah, yeah. you gotta do it yeah, I don't want to be that guy mm. anymore mm. 
who uh, kids himself. Never mind if I lied to you or I lied to the next one. I don't want to lie to myself. You understand? Say, oh, yeah, I'm going to do that next year. Yeah, yeah tomorrow, first thing, I'm going to start on that diet, that exercise. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel good, man. Mm -hmm. So today I'm trying to actually um, show you better than I could tell mm -hmm. you. Show and prove, as we used to say. Don't talk about it. Be about it. Exactly, me. exactly. Um, Scotch 79, let's please touch on that because, uh, you know, as a well, you... I'm Scotch 79. My brother, Lon, he used to write Scotch. He started rhyming under the name Scotch. So he ah, was... so there's the connectivity there. So that's how that came about. He was Lon Scotch and I was Lord Scotch for a while. We were Scotch You can brothers. see where I got confused there, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> you know, just a casual twinning of, of oh, names here. It's, um... <laughs> It was common back then for us to take on uh, side names, aliases, and then get bored of them. And I would give it to my boy, or he'd give me, we'd trade them. You know, there's a famous story uh, in the Dondi book. You ever read that book, Style Master General? No, but I've seen it. I've seen it. I've had it in my hands, Incredible gone through it. Book. Yeah, it's a bulky one as well. It's amazing. But there's one story where Kel. And Dondi traded mm. names. So Dondi was smog and Kel was bus. And they traded and Dondi got the name bus, B-U-S. So me and, and my man Lon used to switch names all the time. So that was a thing? What was yeah. that? Is that to just confuse the law enforcement? Was that something just... No, just you had your main name? Like, I'm always going to be Keel? I had a million side names that I played with, right? Give me some more. What other side names did you have? <laughs> more, more. <laughs> I'll only be quiz why I didn't ask. the years, we'd be here a long really? fucking time. Yeah, <laughs> man. Um, even now, I do it. I write all kinds of throwaway names. Stick to, stovetop. You know what I mean? Like a one-off. Just just trying um, different letters. It's you so get good bored for, yeah, of doing the same letters And it's over so good creatively, again. isn't it? Just trying different stuff out. If you're a style guy, right? Mm -hmm. You want to try to flex different names, different letters in different combinations. It's a challenge. If you're just a, about fame and getting your name up, then yeah, you're better to stick with one name and go all city with it, right? I was never a fame guy. I didn't mm. care about that. Mm. To me, that was boring, just seeing my name over and over again. Keo, 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 Keo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I looked up to guys like Knock 167, right? This dude had many different names. He did outlines for different people. You did, you'd see pieces. You didn't even know what they said or what you recognized from the style. That it was him. Right. So that's what, um, even even the TMT guys, the yeah. TDS guys, they always flip different names. And they would play with, if, if he did Worm, then he would do Warm, mm. right? And he would do Word, and he would do Ward. So that it was oh, like a cool. battle. Yeah, that's cool. And stuff. they might never visit that name again. It was a one-off, you know? So that was the thing that I grew up looking at, and that excited me. I remember when um, Case 2 and Scene, and I'm talking about Scene TC5, did a car called Swivel and Swirl. Swivel and Swirl, right? So this is like 81. Wow. So I was um, riding with a dude named Cess157 at the time, and mm. I told him, yo, we should do kibbles and bits, which was a dog food. Yeah, yeah, they yeah, had a commercial course. back yeah. then, kibbles and bits, kibbles yeah. and bits. I got to get me some kibbles and bits. <laughs> and he was like, nah, that's corny. If you're into your 90s rap, you'll know exactly that, that, that terminology. <laughs> anyway, um, I was always looking for new and weird names. That, to me, was cool. Yeah, yeah. For people to say, who the fuck did that? Who yeah. is that? Somebody go, wait a minute, that's Keo. I recognize the style. That's what I was aspiring to. Because that becomes an inadvertent level of fame based off of your, 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 the focus of style. And what you're doing is you're putting it out there for those that know, almost like a puzzle. Right. Two, 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 two. That's so sick. So to this day, there are dudes 
who I'm just finding out, somebody will post a picture on Instagram and they'll tag someone. And they, that person will come and tell the backstory. Mm. Oh, yeah, Knock 167 did the characters on that car. You're like, what or the Or Knock fuck? gave me the yeah. island. And I've been looking at this same car for years, the mm. pictures, and never knew that Knock was involved. Same thing with a guy named Repel. Repel did outlines for everybody, quick, days. Like, there's a million dudes who posted a piece. Yeah, Repel gave me that outline. Yeah, that's hot. And I'm just now finding out the level of influence mm. this dude had. His name doesn't really ring bells. Like, you say, you know, Dondi's effort, Revolt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Repel? Who the fuck? Yeah. Is Probably more influential. Because he was in the mechanics of certain things happening. And he so was like, giving style to certain cats. Oh, my God, that is Early, so good. when they were coming up, he was like a teacher. Wow. So to know those names is what interested me. Like, who's behind this style? Where yeah. does that come from? So, you know, I didn't become the most famous graffiti writer because that wasn't... I didn't even really care about mm. fame. Like, for a lot of people, that's... They say, oh, the, the name of the game is fame. Mm. To me, that was easy. Let's uh, reverse engineer that conversation just a little bit because we're going back to the Scotch um, conversation with regards to your MCing and rapping. And oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So when I rhymed... I used the name Lord Scotch, MC Lord Scotch. Damn. Before that, I had other MC names. There you go, yeah. So when I first started really getting into rhyming and it became a thing, there were really only two styles of names that most people had. So if your name is um, Kella, right? You could be Kelly Kell or Master Kell, right? Mm -hmm. So I could have been Blakey Blake. Or Master B. Mm -hmm. Both sounded stupid to me. And being the only white boy, <laughs> the only white dude in a cipher rhyming, I didn't think Master was the name. Like, that didn't have a, a, a good ring to That's it. That's also you'd have to really From show me. and prove some pretty e Exactly. So Skills. The first name I came up with for rhyming, and people tease me about it and laugh about it because... Later on, dudes came out like Vanilla Ice and all these cats. I was Vanilla B. That was my first MC there name. You go. Ex and, exclusive. And I ran with a crew. One dude's name was Fudge, and one dude's name was Goldie. No and way. And I was Vanilla. Yeah. So based on our skin tone. Complexions. Yeah. It was complexion, I mean, like, which seems really corny to me now. But, 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 but we were little fucking kids. Yeah. I'm like nine years old, right? So um, by the time I got to high school, and I'm talking 80, 81, and I'm with real MCs now, cats who are nasty, cats who, who lived this thing and really wrote rhymes and studied and battled other dudes were part of a crew that wrote routines where, the, you know, mm. they, they knew how to finish each other's line. and mm. You know what I'm saying? Um, they were taking it to another level. I knew that I needed a name that, you know, was a little more official. Mm. So, Scotch, because my, my father is Scottish and Native American... Scotch Irish, really, but that's a lot. That's mm -hmm. a mouthful. Can be depends how much you drink. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, um, my name became Scotch, and then I thought that Lord, which is some, you know, we're yeah. we're, we're in the UK now. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's some some royalty shit. Hell yeah. It sounded regal. Yeah. And there were no lords at the time. Now you got Lord Jamar, Lord this, Lord mm. that, Lord. That. I'd never heard anybody. I heard. MC this, master that, mm. king this, but I had never heard of another lord back Hell then. Yeah. So I became Lord Scotch, but I also wrote that as a graffiti tag, Scotch 79. Dang and God. then years later, um, when I was doing commercial work, right, or gallery work, I would all, always use the name Scotch 79 because I wanted to keep Keo. Secret. Going back to your original roots of like style writing as opposed to promoting and 
you find your facets, and this is what. Well, I also didn't want to publicly um, be known as Keo because if I was still doing illegal activities, I didn't want to face with the name. Mm. So anytime I did something public facing, I signed it Scotch Seventy Nine. Mm -hmm. um, then <laughs> I got bagged. We we. Um, we destroyed the three yard, and this is a late comeback. This is the clean train era. This is 99 or 2000, mm -hmm. 99. And uh, I went with James Top and a bunch of other cats, PG3, rest in peace. Um, rest in peace. I think BT was with us, rest in peace. Wow. A bunch of us, um, custom, anyway. We had a good crew, but all old men retired. Mm -hmm. It's like flashback, right? <laughs> old timers day. Doing it for old time's sake. So. Yeah. So we destroyed the three yard. Um, somebody took video. Not very smart. Uh, the video circulated. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So years, years after the fact, they came and kicked in my door. I think it was um, almost five years later with no a warrant. No way. With a felony warrant. Wow. They tried to give me five years. But long story short, I wound up doing uh, five years probation, felony probation. Long story short, the Vandal Squad knew who Keo was. They finally had me mm -hmm. dead to rights. After all them years of, Decades as a kid, yeah. I never got bagged really. Um, wow. So as an adult, and then after that, I said, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm retired. Tap it out. Yeah. It's a young man's sport. And once once they got your name and your fingerprints and you know what I mean? Yeah, well, it'll do it to you. You know what I mean? It, 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 it would put anyone on pause, wouldn't it? Yeah. And when you're sitting in, because here's the funny thing. I told you I had a kind of a wild life. I had had felonies in my younger days, never graffiti related. It was about getting some money. Mm -hmm. So as a grown man with a daughter, with responsibility, to be going through the system for graffiti, yeah, yeah. thinking like, really? Yeah, yeah. Is this, is this worth it? And for some people, it may still be worth it. And I don't knock you. That's your personal choice, man. Do it. Mm -hmm. Rock it till the wheels fall off. For me, where I'm trying to go in life, just doesn't make sense. It's awesome to hear the contrast because you know there's always this celebrated anarchic kind of conversations. It's, it's it's refreshing to hear that you come out the other side and say, "Yo, it's up to yours. It's up to you what you do." But these are the consequences, and this is yeah, what happens. One hundred percent. Yeah, man. And um, you know, when I reached a certain age, I put childish things away, and I still love some of those things. Mm. But they're not for me anymore. Mm. They don't love me. So if I try to go backwards and return to those things, there's always a price to pay. Mm. You understand? Knowing what I know now, you can't go back. You, you understand? That's deep. That's deep as fuck. Uh, it's true. Doesn't love you. Yeah. That's so... That, it's poetic. A very romantic statement because actually I think that comes a time in anyone's creation, even if you're an actor... Even if you're a, 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 in a band, sure, it comes a point where you've just got to say to yourself, well, I, I'm never going to stop loving you, but, you know, well, things this, move. I've heard this from many musicians that, you know, the, the songs they made when they were 16 or whatever, yeah. um, people want them to continue that. That's your hit. Yeah. You got to play that. And it's like, okay, I want to mature as an artist. I want to mm. develop. I want to show you what I'm, where I'm at now. Yeah. That was cool when I was 16. But I'm 55. Yeah, yeah. If I'm singing the same song, that means I haven't grown. It's archived. It's, it becomes their nostalgia. But the streets want you to stay the same. Yeah. The streets love you, <laughs> you know, but they're not going to pay your bail. Yes, right. Yes, yes, exactly. Right? So all these cats telling you, keep it real, keep it real, they're, they're, they're not going to um, pay for your, your legal fees. So that's a personal choice everyone has to make. For me, if God forbid, well, I'm not even going to talk about that. If I'm in the central booking, <laughs> right? If I'm going through the system as a 55-year-old man, as a grandfather, 
with a brand new grandson, and you say, yo, what are you in here for? And I say, writing my name on the wall? You should slap the shit out of me. You should whoop my fucking ass. I need my ass beat. Okay? <laughs> and that's just for me. That's, that's, that's where I'm at. If other people feel differently and they can um, still get away with the things they got mm. away with in their youth and it brings you joy, by all means. You know, you, you don't have to live how I live. Sage words yes. coming from this, this Don here. Um, and timestamps you have been. Uh, now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of dial in a bit more here, starting from uh, you were homeless. You were homeless, and then you met MF Doom. Am I correct in saying that? How did it, uh, roughly speaking, because okay. so, you moved in with him, right, or something well, to that effect? Y- you want the full story or the or the the, the short, condensed version? Whichever one you're comfortable. Because with, when so. I say I was homeless, there were many years where um, I didn't have a place, but I was getting money and I had a girlfriend over here and, a, you know mm-hmm. what I mean, crashing over here with this one and that one. So um, when when you say homeless, people have the uh, image mm. of a guy with a cardboard sign, right, sitting yeah, on the sidewalk. Kind of thing, yeah. And that wasn't my thing. I was in the clubs dressed fresh with jewelry on. Gotcha. With no home. So how did, so how did you make... selling drugs or whatever. So I wound up getting incarcerated. I went to jail. I had to go through the system. I came back to New York maybe 10 years later after completing parole and everything. I met MF Doom. So um, many, many years had elapsed between the time (laughs) when I was um, actively writing graffiti Mm -hmm. Because I got more into the drug game and the street shit and trying to get money. And, and I began to get high on my own supply. Mm-hmm. I fell victim to all the ills of the street. And um, graffiti and hip hop took a back seat. Mm-hmm. It wasn't until I was institutionalized that I began to get back into my artwork again and think about these things. And that creativity kind of brought me back to sanity. Nice. Okay? And just like I said with graffiti, once you get bagged, right, at some point they got your number, the gig is up. It's not going back, yeah. Right. You can continue, but then you're like saying, I don't don't give a fuck. You know, I want to to go back to jail. And I'm not that guy. Mm. The the drug game was the same thing. Mm. Once I got busted, it was time to realize, like, you're not cutting it as a gangster. Mm. This is not for you. I'm, I'm, I was the least successful drug dealer in New York. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, because you got done. You got got. Yeah, if, if you use your own supply and can't even re-up, mm. if you mess up the money, you know, y- you're not playing the game properly. Mm-hmm. So, but it took me many years to, to surrender to that admission that this wasn't working for mm. me. To, to, to come to that decision for myself. So artwork was about all that was left for me. Mm-hmm. And luckily at that time, you know, um, going through the system and not just jails, but institutions, therapeutic communities and being sentenced to these, you know, alternative to incarceration, drug programs, shock, all the things I went through, my artwork Flourished. Kept me sane in there. Mm-hmm. It also was a little hustle in jail. You can always make some money, some commissary or whatever, if you're nice with art. Mm-hmm. Okay? Um, so it brought me back to that. So that when I came out, the first thing, I was already in the game. Mm. And before MF Doom, I was already doing um, logo design and album covers and uh, merchandise, um, clothing graphics, you understand? Nice. So MF Doom was just one of the cats that I worked with, and I'm grateful for all of them. That was a relationship that created... You know, it became like a, almost a cult classic, that mm. album that we did. Mm. 
But I had no idea that um, that is the one that I would be known for. People, Isn't that crazy, is yeah. it? You just punt and you just do it and you don't think anything of it until suddenly everyone thinks something of it. Well, I had worked with a lot of major label artists and big name um, artists, especially within hip hop, mm -hmm. that I thought those things would be more impressive in my portfolio. Mm -hmm. No, people remember me for Operation Doomsday, MF Doom, yo, that's the guy who made his mask. Like, people love mm -hmm. the... Um, entire package that we created and the it mythology wasn't just his music yeah it wasn't just his lyrics because he produces his own beats it was the visual mm. and we collaborated on all of that he mm. had a vision for what he wanted and it worked did you did you because obviously you would have been privy to that vision was it was there a real conversation of you, you could you, you could cut it with a knife in the room you knew what he wanted because he you could he could he could describe it in such a way and he, he couldn't just describe it. He could sketch it for you. Doom was a graffiti writer and, mm. a, and an amazing visual artist and later on became a sculptor and all kinds mm. of things. Um, to me, he was a, like an alchemist, man. He was a, a dude who, he dealt with sciences and mathematics mm. and he understood um, gemstones and certain metals and, and their, wow. not just their... Uh, physical properties but spiritual properties right and and herbs and 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 teas and different uh remedies you understand he was dealing with a whole lot of um so he schooled me to a lot of things mm. you understand and there was significance in everything that he did for example i i did a five-pointed star next to his name which is standard graffiti yeah. 101 right we have a way to connect it Boom. the way i learned since a kid the way i've always done it it flows naturally most graffiti writers from new york use the same star i don't i'm trying to find an example but anyway it's a one line yeah yeah boom 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 he was like no mine has to have six points everything meant something to him and was um significant wow and vitally important like I say, I wasn't the most up guy in New York. I wasn't the king of nothing. But when it came to style, I really wanted to master mm. letter forms, right? And every line had to be perfect. Every line meant something. You didn't just throw arrows off your letters, right? It, it, there had to be a reason. Mm. Every connection was a, to balance something else, you know? So when I hear a lot of... um rappers nowadays it's just haphazard slap happy you know it doesn't impress me because i've been around cats who really mastered the craft with importance of each detail yeah, man yeah and there's three levels to every one of mf doom's rhymes like there's the surface and there's the, there's a deeper meaning and then there's a personal you know that only only cats who really knew him would catch that inference you know oh, what that's i mean so good yeah and i love that how that could influence you with your writing influence you with your your own journey in rap as well as your own coming to being now in fact i was going to segue and say doom actually when he was he came over um and went straight to chrome and black when he oh, came over here before wow. Yeah. yeah, is that where they Adidas filmed the video yeah, of him? Yeah, exactly. Oh, that was Chrome God. and Black. Wow, yeah. that's going to be full circle yeah. to, for me to go there. So this is what's happening. This is in part the reason why you're here and joining us now is is you have a, a big event coming to... Uh, well, it'll be today. When you watch it, it'll be today. You can go and see it. Uh, it's uh, Chrome and Black, your exhibition yes. and, and conversations. Yeah, so um, <laughs> to bring it all back full circle, like I said, maybe I wasn't the king of New York, or the most up guy, but I did develop some style along the way, and I like to share that with the world. If people, um, If you're interested in that kind of thing... I will have some outlines, original black book pages, and some prints for sale, reasonably priced, um, because I like to uh, share this stuff with the world. I think there's value in preserving and continuing real New York subway graffiti style. 
and um there's a lot of other things going on now street art and and it's wonderful <laughs> but sometimes it gets confused with what I learned and what I do core cool principles right and it can water down um the the original essence of this can get lost mm -hmm. so um especially in London Everywhere I've gone, I see real style writing being kept alive, man. Mm -hmm. And um, that makes me happy, and it encourages me to continue doing what I'm doing. So, yeah, I'll be there. Um, it's just a pop-up, a one-day thing. I'll be signing some work. I'll, I'll uh, personalize it for you if you like. And, you know, come through and cop something or just come through and, uh, you know, shake my hand. As you can probably tell he's a great conversationist and it would be a pleasure to... I'm definitely going down there. You're right. going into the nerve centre of London graffiti, that's for sure. Okay. You're, you know, if you, if you didn't start here in, 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 in hitting a nerve centre, you, you're going on to the extended family of Chrome and Black. And, <laughs> and furthermore, man, like, to purchase one of your items, and this is what I'm hoping that's being put across here on the episode, is it isn't just you know, a payday for you. It's actually supporting and funding the whole motivation of being here, the reason why you do what you do, and which is the reason for most things when it comes to buying art. But this is an example here of somebody that puts his money where his mouth is and gets over here, does the thing, and supports himself strictly through the art. And I'm also now, I'm getting into what, what you're doing here, which is... um for lack of a better term, they call it content creation there now, right? Go. So um, um, I've always been a storyteller and I've always um, been interested in the verbal history, the oral histories, the legacy, um, preserving the stuff that you're not going to find mm. in the books and the films, you know? Uh, you, you're not going to learn it in, from a YouTube or, or a, a, a university class. So... These are the kind of things that I'm trying to capture. I'm interviewing cats while they're still here and alive Beautiful. to tell their stories. Beautiful. And, uh, yeah, so that'll be coming soon. And um, after London, I'm going straight to Amsterdam, and we're doing something over there. So um, what's that? The 19th through the 26th, I guess. I'll be at the Strat Museum. Dope. So if you're clocking this in Amsterdam or you're in those areas, Come get in that check car, me make out. it happen. Yeah. For real. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I'm just uh, loving life, exploring, yeah. seeing the world, man. Learning stories with the content creating side of things, trust me, once, once you pop, you don't stop with these things. It's yeah. an incredible and journey. I'm a, I'm a student. I'm watching what you're doing. Just like <laughs> a, yeah. you say you got to learn from the dons, Yo. right? I'm always learning. Mm -hmm. I'm always observing, man, yeah. and building. Well, I'm always here if you need any help and steering. You know, I've got the textbooks ready. I'll just transcribe that straight onto, uh, onto WhatsApp. And you got the best hat collection I've ever seen. I'm very jealous of Killer Keller's lids. What do you the call lids. them here? Brims? Yeah, the, the, the brims are real. <laughs> very good. Kyo, it's been an absolute pleasure having you inside the house, my brother. Honestly, the family Peace. is here. You tea in the pot, drinks in the fridge. Yeah, ashtray on the table always. And don't do drugs, mm. do graffiti. Don't do graffiti, yes, exactly. Create artwork, mm. build something. Mm -hmm. um, whoever told you crime doesn't pay, they probably chose the wrong crime. Mm -hmm. Right? Pick the right crime. Mm -hmm. That's right. You know the deal, man. <laughs> Kill again a podcast. Our lane was out of fashion, sharing is caring. Like you said, crime don't pay, but neither do they. Yeah, peace to Sharon and Karen. Mm. Thank you, Sharon and Karen. Thank you, Sharon and Karen. Hold tight. <laughs> um, <laughs> and all affiliates, everyone that's down, all right? Remember, sharing is caring. Tell a friend to tell a friend, all right? Yes, and all the ships at sea. Is it? Is it? Look after yourself. Don't talk to anyone. I wouldn't. Peace. <laughs> peace, peace, peace. Good stuff. You know what I would say. <laughs>